Anyway, really excited to be here uh, and to talk a little bit about games and gamification and really talk about why embrace games and gamification for learning. Uh, there's lots of reasons to do it. It really makes a difference in the instruction that you deliver and design and create. And even if you're not creating a game, what it does is it gives the sense of more interaction and more activity. In fact, there's tons of research about active learning and how it's really important for learning outcomes. So having a game foundation, understanding games, doing games, really great, great way to go. Um, my name is Carl Kopp. I'm an instructor of professional uh, of instructional instructional technology at Bloomsburg University, a bunch of LinkedIn learning courses. So if you're interested in gamification after that, I've got a bunch of courses there. And I have a little fun project that I've been doing in YouTube called the Unofficial Unauthorized History of Learning Games. So uh, check that out for a lot of fun filled facts on learning games. But first, what I'd like you to do is indicate your favorite childhood game in the chat. Just go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll check out everybody's favorite childhood game. And hello, I see some high Carls. Hey, Deb, uh, great to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Monopoly, Fable, Clue, Harvest Moon, Candyland, Pac-Man. We're going to talk about Candyland in a little bit. Uh, Booby Trap. I always like the game Mousetrap. I don't know if that's uh, there in there. Uh, Stefan likes Mousetrap as well. Clue's always fun. Jax is a great game. Oregon Trail, Dig Dug. Lots of different games here. Um, let's then ask this question. So you've indicated your favorite childhood game, but why did you like that game? What about that particular game made it interesting to you? Why did you like that particular game? So the challenge, some people are saying, uh, challenge looks like uh, a lot of people are saying that. And the, the storytelling, um, the winning, <laughs> who doesn't like winning? Resource management, I see. Uh, the person says, hey, I'm super competitive. The mystery, solving, the discovery, the collecting, sounds, interactions, strategy. Great. Those are all really great reasons. But what I noticed is nobody said points, badges, or the leaderboard, right? Well, maybe being the winner in the leading leaderboard is one. So the, those ideas about challenge, about resource management, about <laughs> rivalry with your um, siblings, all that really is involved with what I call deeper gamification, where you're really looking at things that motivate us and drive us to be successful. And the interesting thing to me is that games have been around for so long and have done so many things for us that um, we kind of take it for granted. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, answering these questions. How have games been used historically for instruction and learning? And we're going to, all these questions are like kind of in order, but we're going to sprinkle the answers all throughout. So uh, you'll see answers throughout this presentation. What is the connection between games and learning? And can games change behaviors, attitudes, and outcomes? So that's really what I want to look at and really think about the historical issue of games. So let's first dive into that. How have games been used historically for instruction and learning? And they're not new. So it's very fascinating to me. In the year 2000, everybody, when video games kind of broke through to the mainstream, people were saying, hey, serious games, we've invented this new concept. Aren't we really smart? Aren't we really clever? And then I had to do a little bit of research and found out, you know what? In 1970, there was literally a book written called Serious Games. So we're not the first ones. And if we go way back in time, we go to the Chimera chess in the 12th and 13th century, or perhaps even further than that, people were saying chess was a way of teaching military strategy. And originally, some of the chess pieces, the elephants, the warriors, were a direct reflection on the pieces on the battlefield. So for a long time, chess worked like that. And this is really interesting to me. For a long time, games were very or played in a very abstract medium, right? You had a board. It was the same board. It wasn't really, it was kind of represented in real life, but it wasn't real life. So it was this abstraction. And that works pretty well, but it was, you know, you had to do a little bit of work to transfer the learning from that abstract area into actually action. But then an interesting thing happened 
about the 1600s. It's, it's not on here, but um, in Prussia, what was created was this thing called the Kriegspiel, which is actually uh, German or Prussian for war game. And in the 1600s, the Prussians were beating everybody and they had smaller armies and they had less resources. People said, why? Why are the Prussians so good at this? Well, it turns out someone actually decided that instead of an abstract board to move our military pieces on, why don't we use a map? And that's about the same time cartography became really started to get popular and all of a sudden they could map out how many moves and how long it would take to move troops from point a to point b they could map out how long it would take to move around a natural obstacle and all of a sudden this abstract game became very concrete as people thought about how they could battle one another and in fact um, the american craig spell was actually used during the civil war so people started saying hey wait a minute we can kind of predict what's going to happen we can do what if scenarios this is really great for us and then in 1932, a woman named Mary Burstein over in Russia took the idea of war games and applied it to the management of a typewriter factory. And so she decided to teach managers how to operate a typewriter factory using a game. And it was wildly successful. She went on to create something like 18, 20 more games and was interrupted only by uh, World War II when um, her services were called somewhere else. And then she came back and actually uh, created some more games. But she's actually known as the godmother of corporate gaming because she actually was the first person in recorded history to bring that sensibility to the organization. Now, it may have happened before and nobody just recorded it, but uh, Mary gets the credit for that. And then in 1957, uh, there was a game called Monopologues. I noticed some of you liked Monopoly as a game. And that was an Air Force strategy game, not for battle, but for logistics. So I say creating typewriters and Air Force logistics, not the most exciting elements, but they were gamified, turned into a game uh, way back when. And then in 1970s, of course, uh, there was a lot of movement in games and serious games. So the idea that this is a newfangled thing or that, hey, we shouldn't use games. And in fact, um, I bought, I went to the library. Uh, someone said that, hey, um, they worked with somebody who was, quote unquote, the godfather of gamification, who invented gamification. And I'm like, you know what? I don't really think that guy invented gamification. Let me do a little research. So I bought all these books from the library and found out in 1967, there I have one of the books that says, that complains actually, that there were so many games in boardrooms across the United States that it was almost like a cliche, like a must have. You must have some kind of strategy game in your boardroom room if you're a CEO. And then it's interesting because games follow society, right? So 1960s, 70s, kind of very liberal time in the United States. But then the 80s kind of ushered in a much more conservative approach to business and, and culture and all that. And games went away. And uh, they were not used for a long time in corporations. They were not seen as corporate enough or they were seen as too loose. Um, which is interesting because the military has been using games forever and so have uh, medical doctors and medical facilities, which I always find interesting. Like, I can't think of anything more life and death than war or more life and death than medical. And yet they've been using games for uh, learning and those kind of things from way back when. So uh, really kind of, of interesting and educators as well, someone uh, noted. So um, it's kind of fallen out of favor. But then in the 2000s, with the advent of video games, it came back. So my point is that humans like games, and we use games for learning lots of things. In fact, in the 1940s, this is I find this fascinating. There's lots of war game uh, 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 stories about games, but uh, 
in Japan, there was something called the Total War Institute, and it was part of the Japanese government, and they conducted a, t a ton of war games and economic games. So they gamed everything to see what would happen if we did this, what would happen if we did that, how would that occur, you know, all those kind of things, which was really interesting. And one of the times they did, they war gamed the invasion of Midway. And during the war gaming of Midway, and how this basically works is you have two teams, you have, you know, the ally team, and then you would have the Japanese team, and you have kind of an umpire or a referee in the middle, and the Japanese uh, side would tell the, you know, hey, we're going to do this, we're going to bomb this, we're going to do this, and then the umpire would kind of tell the other team what happens and, and how that went. Well, one of the admirals uh, got an unfavorable ruling from one of the umpires in, as they were wargaming the Battle of Midway, the Japanese um, admiral. It didn't like it, and so he bullied the guy into changing his call. So instead of like the aircraft carriers being sunk, they were only damaged, but they didn't go under. Um, so this pro-invasion admiral kind of bullied the outcome. And so the Japanese came out of Midway, this war game exercise, much more confident and much more certain in their win than they should have been. Now, uh, one thing that also helped the Americans during that time was uh, we were able to um, we were able to grab some of the communications, which doesn't hurt in uh, wartime, but. The idea that war games were used that, in fact, uh, Admiral Nimitz said that every scenario in World War II was war gamed except the kamikazes. He said we didn't predict the kamikazes. So two lessons from that. One, no matter how much you war game and prepare, there will always be kamikazes. And two, humans are so ingenuitive uh, that was a dark ingenuity, but so uh, uh, thought, you know, outside of the box that there are times that you can't determine what's going to happen. But in the military, it's so interesting to me that games are used to test personnel tactics, procedures, everything to see how it's going to work. And those same concepts and ideas could be used in corporations and have been in the past and could be used again in the future. In fact, in the 1970s, there was a game put out by British Petroleum, BP, about um, being an oil, uh, successful oil company. And one of the interesting things in that game is one of the contingencies or one of the bad things that could happen to you was a blowout of an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. And lo and behold, that happened. So what games allow us to do is think about the unthinkable. So let's talk about what the connection is between games and learning. So I talked a little bit as I touched that, but there are some more connections that I think are interesting to explore and to talk about. And this is from a, a meta-analysis, a review of literature. Um, and uh, the, the quote is here. This review, a bunch of bunch of reviews, confirms that games and simulations contribute to lots of different outcomes. Cognitive learning outcomes, including knowledge acquisition, conceptual application, which means being able to apply conceptual knowledge, content understanding, meaning understanding what this content means, and action-directed learning, which means hands-on learning by doing. So if you hear someone say, oh, games, they don't really teach anything, or they can't teach uh, a much, uh, the opposite is true. Games can teach a great deal of information and games can also uh, teach a great deal of really um, thoughtful reflection and critical thinking. And if you think about what's needed now more than anything is critical thinking. Games force you to think through different win states and different ways to win. So there's lots of ways that we can think about that, but um, games help you to think through that process. And games help us in a number of other ways also. So video games front and center. So, so let's go to where games can really help us and uh, think about that. And I think there are lots of ways that we can think about this. So one is, um, working with soldiers, former war fighters, about how to cope with 
being back into society. And um, there's been a study, um, uh, Dr. Karras and, and a bunch of people, I think down in Maryland, studied veterans in video game playing. And they found that video games did a number of things for the veterans. One was adaptive coping. So the video game was a positive distraction, gave them a sense of control, uh, gave them a sense of symptom substitution, right? You feel anxious because, you know, you're not around, but now you're anxious because of the game. You can transport that. And also edemonic well-being, which means it give, gave the soldiers, the veterans, a sense of confidence, insight, and what their roles happen to be. And then a sense of socializing, right? Participation, support, camaraderie, all those from the game. So the the vision that a lot of people have is this gamer is an isolated person sitting in their basement, um, you know, playing video games by themselves. And that's completely not true. Well, not completely not true. I'm sure there's some, some exceptions there, but mostly people are playing games, even online video games with other people. So they're involved with other people. And that's one thing that I think is important to consider that games are mostly a communal event, a social event. In fact, games grew more than any other activity during the pandemic at all because of that, um, because of uh, that uh, ability to bring people together. So um, Dr. Kara said that when you're battling yourself with the traumatic thoughts and you lose yourself in a game, right? And she said that during the pandemic, real life was traumatic and games were able to help people cope. So uh, there were games like uh, dodgeball, which they called it Corona ball. There were ways of, uh, uh, there was called Corona tag. So people use games to come to terms with what's going on around them. So how can games help us make sense of the world around us? And if you think about it, we can use it for something as critical as a pandemic, but also as practical as understanding the sales environment that you're in, as important as understanding what a competitor might do or how to do different items. So there's lots of different ways to do that. I noticed some really great chats about games. One of the things that I um, have, uh, we'll save this question for later, but one of the things that I've started to get into is different card games. The versatility and the utilitarian sense of card games makes them an excellent way to integrate learning games into what you're doing. And one of the reasons is because everybody knows how to play a card game. You don't have to talk about shuffling. You don't have to explain to somebody about dealing. You don't have to do anything like that because people know how to do that. So um, I've created a digital card game platform that you can totally customize the cards and uh, you can play uh, multiplayer games or single player games and found a great deal of success. And because it's digital, you can even put in, um, you can even put in videos and audios. And so you've expanded card games beyond what can be done. And you um, use those for scenario based games. And the neat thing about that is you can challenge somebody challenge their answer and then you have a whole game thing going on so there's lots of ways to do that but i but i've i've really kind of i developed a lot of games in unity and a lot of complex games for pharma companies one called zombie sales apocalypse where um it was really a, an exciting game where you had to go in and it was a branching scenario and if the uh you answered incorrectly the pharma the the doctor that you were talking to, the healthcare provider turned into a zombie and so then the zombie would chase you around which was a lot of fun uh, but interestingly, um, a lot of the sales reps uh, had a lot of trouble manipulating their character. Like, how do I turn my character? How do I run from point A to point B? And we, we kind of made it as simple as possible, but they still got caught up in the cognitive overhead of the game. And so um, I came to sales uh, because I came to cards because you don't have that cognitive overhead you know how a card game works. So um, that's one thing to think about when you're implementing games into these situations. You don't want them overly complicated because 
um, the learners there to learn, not learn how to play the game, but learn in general. But so how can games help us make um, sense? Well, they give us a measure of control, insight into actions and behaviors, big picture. So let's talk about each of these briefly. The first is measure of control. So what that allows you to do is project locus of control, right? So locus of control is when you feel where the control is. You either feel that the control is outside you, you're overwhelmed, things are happening to you, you're not taking charge. But if you can use the locus of control and move it internally, you then feel more confident, you have a measure of control, and you have um, a sense of what your actions mean and their consequence. So games allow us to control what's happening. We can decide to lay a card out or not lay a card out. We can decide to challenge another player or not challenge a player. So in that game environment, we have a lot of control. And if that game is around something that we're trying to learn, we get to control how we're going to learn or process that information. Games also give us insight into actions and behaviors. Games are a wonderful what if tool. So we did some training with a company. Uh, this is this is funny because it was a computer company, a technology company, a software company, and they wanted us to create a board game for them. And we created this board game that we were able to, over three days, allow them to um, gain insight into moving from a line manager to somebody up at the enterprise level, right? They were teaching people to think at the enterprise level instead of the um, their narrow focused vertical line of business. And the insights into decisions that they made, into investments that they made, were like aha moments for these people. A lot of them took actions in the game that optimized their group, but was not good for the whole company. So games allow us to slow down and see actions and consequences at a different level. And that level then helps us make good decisions. Games, uh, and that helps with the big picture, right? You can see everything that's going on. And sometimes in games, literally, you can see the big picture by looking down at the game board. A long time ago, I was involved with a game at an insurance company, and we were playing the game, and the only way in that game you could acquire new customers was to buy companies, buy other insurance companies. And it was really fascinating because you could only do that you can only come to that like conclusion by playing the game. Like it was a visceral understanding I and mean, you could literally see the big picture. And it also allows us to make sense of the world around us. We live in a very complex world and uh, especially the business side of it. So when we play games, it allows us to make sense of what's going on in our world and allows us to make some predictions about how we would act in that world and what will happen in that world. It also allows us games, if they're well designed, allow us to express concern. Like the Western view of games is typically competitive. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to defeat you. I'm going to win and you're going to lose. But, but, a lot of European games are collaborative games. And one of the things that we're missing is collaborative games. And uh, Itty, I, actually, I know that question is for Jennifer, but I actually have a game uh, for leadership and management training. It's, it's a version of that board game that I talked about, and it's about making good leaders and, and good managers. Um, so it's definitely possible to do that, and they're definitely out there that can be done. And um, Nowadays, with the technology, you can print out board games 100% custom. You can come up with like places like um, uh, thegamecrafter.com and other areas where you can create 100% uh, custom games. But games that are collaborative allow us to express concerns to others and allow us to think about um, our own concerns, as well as gain empathy for others. Games allow us to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. They allow us to think about how somebody else would feel 
in this situation. So games can very much help with us expressing concern and also seeking understanding. So it's really interesting if you look at the uh, AAA game Assassin's Creed and all its different iterations, one of the last versions of Assassin's Creed, they actually created an educational version of ancient Egypt. And so this is an example of a four game first person shooter, first person adventure game that actually was modified to be a learning game. And so it had all of the elements of a AAA title that allowed you to learn. It's very similar. There's a, a, a company um, in, uh, that's out of Texas A&M, um, Andre Thomas runs that company, and they do games for algebra and games for art history that look like a 3D AAA title. I mean, it's pretty impressive what they're doing there. Uh, and the calculus one is amazing. Games also allow us to try on behavior. So if you've ever played the game Red Dead Redemption, you can actually play as a, uh, a, a good cowboy or a bad cowboy. You get to try on, hey, what's it like to be bad? What's it like to, to be deviant? What's it like not to follow the rules? What's this like? So games give us permission to kind of try things out in a safe manner, to check things out in the safety of our own game, knowing that we can try something again if it's not successful, knowing that we can fail safely and do it over again. That's why they're great for management training and sales training and even operations training because it allows us to try and check things out. And not this is this is not thought of often, but games give us a visceral understanding, right? We can read something and we can understand something, but a game lets us feel something. It lets us experience emotions and one of the things that i think is missing from a lot of leadership training a lot of management training is a sense of emotion right we treat people as if they were an object and here's the input a and you get the output b if you do this you'll get this but what we forget is these people have a whole other life lives. So your management technique of, you know, nobody can ever be late, or I think what, um, what did Facebook do recently, or Meta now, they said, um, all you poor performers better watch out, because they're going to weed out poor performers, right, based on what Jack Welch did. Well, it turns out, Jack Welch's theory was totally debunked. His um, getting rid of the lower 10% of employees, like all didn't work, right? I mean, where is GE today, right? It totally did not work. So, um, we need to think about the emotions of others, and we need to think about, you know, if you look at diversity and inclusion, how do you truly understand what somebody else is going through? You can't, but you can get closer with a game than you could reading about it uh, on a, a e-learning um, module, right? So that's a lot of things that you can do to kind of move in that direction. So um, as someone said, the reality is that playing helps us process the world around us. So if we can play, we can process. And so this processing uh, is going to be very helpful as we go through looking at games. So one interesting game somebody mentioned before that I think is really uh, neat is the concept of Candyland. And Candyland was developed because of a pandemic. And it was a pandemic of um, uh, smallpox, uh, where kids were ending up in iron lungs. Kids were ending up with braces. Kids were not able to move, and they were put into the hospital. Oh, uh, yeah, polio. Thank you. Thanks. I, for, I, I It's not smallpox. It was polio. So... Um, the interesting thing is that the game was specifically designed to combat polio and the feelings that came with polio. What do I mean by that? Well, the woman that created the game, a former nurse, actually made the game non-symmetrical. She made it very curved to give the freedom of movement as opposed to the confinement in the iron lungs. She made it 
uh, effortless to move through the game because the kids had such effort to move. She made it meandering so it wouldn't be a rigid routine. She created a sense of movement because there was non-movement. She made it colorful because hospitals were not colorful. So the purpose and design of this game was in sharp contrast to the actual situation that the learners were in. Yeah, visual uh, kinesthetics. And the neat thing about that is this is a good way to think about designing experiences, right? So if we want somebody to have a positive attitude or we want somebody to be positive toward customers, maybe the experience we create for them is much more positive. Maybe the design we create is less rigid, right? Maybe we take exactly what's wrong. We kind of create training or games to address what's wrong. So really kind of interesting whole design concept that that has been developed for Candyland. And so and, and if you look through the history of lots of other games, there, there are um, examples of this all throughout the creation of games. And so uh, I think it's really important. So for example, one of the first card games was in 940 um, uh, BC. And when you think of 940 BC, um, those games, they were card games, but they had scenarios on them. And so even back then, they were creating like scenario-based card games, which I think is so fascinating. So here's a digital game that I just wanted to point out, you know, as we're uh, hopefully winding down this pandemic, but who knows? Every time I turn around, there's another pop-up of, of another outbreak. But there's a game called Pandemic 2, and it was placed on Addicting Games in 2008. And in the first 12 days of March 2020, like during the pandemic, uh, its page experienced a 3,500% increase in views. And that sounds a little bit morbid, right? Hey, we are going through a pandemic, so everybody wants to play this game called Pandemic. Like, what is that all about? But it's really about um, sense making. It's really about understanding the world around us. And interestingly, in Pandemic, you actually play the bad person, right? You actually play the enemy. You can be a virus, you can be a bacteria, you can be a parasite. And your job in this game is to infect the entire world. That's your job in the game. So uh, really kind of interesting. And one of the neat things about it is that I, I picked uh, – <laughs> Uh, a virus, right? The, the the coronavirus. And then you can pick how you want yourself. You're trying to, again, affect the whole world. And this teaches you about it because um, how do you want to spread? Do you want to spread through sneezing? Do you want to cause heart failure? Do you want fever? And you quickly learn that you don't want too many deadly consequences. You want sick enough, but not so sick that you kill the patient because killing the patient stops the spread. And so you come up with this whole idea of how a virus spreads. And while you're configuring your virus so you can take over the world, you're learning about how viruses spread. You're learning about how disease goes from one person to another. And you also are learning about uh, measures that the government can take, right? Airports are open or airports are closed, hospitals close, borders are open. I mean, it was a really interesting display of what happens. And also interestingly, I have a little, a little video on this. Um, well, prior to the pandemic, there was actually uh, a tabletop simulation done in Chicago called the Crimson Contagion, which tracked uh, – a virus very similar to COVID coming to Chicago and spreading it throughout the United States and eventually the world. Um, and some of the things that Chicago did uh, to mitigate in this game, this tabletop simulation, actually they put into place and helped them uh, uh, with some control measures actually in Chicago. So the game really kind of works um, as they're going on there. 
So uh, really interestingly, this game. So if you have a chance, you can play the game. You can see it spreading. The other thing that I want to talk about here is that the, uh, James, that was a good one. Um, the thing here is that this is an overly. Com I want to. I want to say this is not an overly complicated game, right? I don't have three D characters. I don't have lots of great graphics. You don't need that for games to be compelling. Right, very simple overlay. Uh, here I'm using red versus uh, uh, green, you know, all that kinds of stuff. So um, it's really uh, a way to think about that we don't have to get really involved to do this kind of thing. We can use very simple games to accomplish our goals. So finally, we want to talk about can learning games change behaviors, attitudes, and outcomes? And if you've been with me so far, I'm sure you're like, yeah, I think he's going to go there. Um, yes. Uh, spoiler alert. The answer is yes. Um, so here's an interesting quote. Games have the power to teach, train, and educate and are effective means for learning skills and attitudes that are not so easy to learn by rote memorization. Now, the one thing I want to say is, is games aren't for everything, right? We as designers of instruction or learning architects or whatever we're called today, um, we shouldn't use one tool for every job. So every tool, we don't need a game for everything. But the idea of teaching complex, nuanced, com convoluted topics, a game is really good. It can accelerate time. You can sit down and go through a process of manufacturing, of supply chain, of sales, of outmaneuvering an enemy, about strategy. And you can try things out, right? All of those kind of things are really important for games and for understanding. And so games can teach things at a level that I don't think other medium are able to do. And so um, when we approach the topic and we have diagnosed it like leadership, like I think games are great for leadership, right? When you have to balance things, you have to um, make a call, right? Sometimes you want to lead without any questions. Sometimes you want a democratic leadership, but sometimes you have to say, follow me, we're going this way or you're all going to die, right? Like, because that's, a, I mean, it's really interesting how games can kind of do that. So I want to give you an example of how game, games get a bad rap, right? They're always like, oh, uh, violent games cause violent behavior. Um, the, there's some ambiguous research out there about that. There's not one definitive answer. Um, I do think that people that are predisposed to violence are definitely predisposed to violent games. And um, is there some kind of correlation there? Yes, I'm not exactly sure the game causes it because plenty of people play violent games and are not violent. Um, but we have to be careful about that, right? We can't, we can't be too cavalier about what, what we depict in games, but also in books. I mean, some of the most vile stuff on earth is written in books. We don't ban all books, but we, we say, okay, let's be careful about who we give books for, what the books and all that kind of stuff. But what gets overlooked often is this sense of fostering pro-social behavior. So let me just real quickly tell you about a study. There were three games that the researchers studied. Um, one is a, a game that was very violent. It was called uh, um, Lamers. Oh, this was the lamers. Lamers. And in lamers, what you needed to do was um, try to kill all the lamers, right? So you could blow, blow them up. You could shoot them. You could whatever. There was a one game called Lemmings where you tried to save the lemmings. You, you move them through an obstacle course to safety. And one was Tetris. That was the neutral game. So Lemmings, uh, pro-social game. Lamers, anti-social game. Tetris, neutral. And they had people uh, play that game. And then somebody, a researcher, came in and dropped pencils. Would the person pick up the pencils? 28% of the people that played the antisocial game helped to pick up pencils, about a quarter. 33% of the people that played Tetris helped to pick up the pencils. 
But the helping game, Lemmings, 67% of people just immediately after playing this game help to pick up pencils. So there's lots of research that shows games lead to pro-social behavior, uh, even long-term. Um, here's another example. This is City of Heroes. This is a game where you fly a helicopter around, picking up people off of burning buildings. And this is a really fascinating city because every building is on fire. I wouldn't want to live here, but it does make for a fun game. But anyway, so you have to fly around the buildings and picking up people. And they wanted to see, okay, maybe picking up pencils. I mean, come on, that's pretty, you know, whatever. Let's do it. Let's make, let's up the stakes. Let's have a, uh, a male researcher come in, in cahoots with the female researcher, and start yelling at her and say, where have you been? I've been looking for you all day. You have to come with me immediately. And then see whether or not the person playing the game intervened in any way. And they found out that the people that played the antisocial game, 22% intervened. It's about a quarter. They didn't use Tetris this time. They just used uh, the pro-social game. And they found out that 56% of the people playing the pro-social game intervened. So playing the pro-social game actually had an influence on the behavior of the individuals. So my point here is that games can shape attitudes. Games can shape cognitive knowledge. Games can shape behavior. So all of those things that we want from our learning programs can be achieved through the right application of the right correctly designed game, which I think is really kind of exciting. So how do games do it? Well, just real briefly, because I'm running out of time here, we look at basic human psychological needs, the need for competence, need for autonomy, which making our own decisions, the, mean, mean, uh, the search for meaningfulness, and the need to be socially related to each other. That's all self-determination theory. And then how do we do that? Well, we give people granular feedback, sustained feedback, cumulative feedback. We give them choices. We give them volitional engagement, a sense of relevance, like all that kind of stuff, shared goals. And then we can match that to elements inside of a game. So while we don't play a game for points, granular feedback is really important to shape our behavior. Badges are really important for cumulative feedback, right? Meaningful stories are a way that we make knowledge and games can give us that story. So all of this is really uh, helpful as we go through uh, different elements and we think about different elements. So all of that can be really, really helpful. Okay, so uh, I'm out of time here, but basically what we've done today is we've discovered how games have been used historically for instruction and learning in a variety of different settings. And again, um, I'm really having fun with my YouTube channel and my unofficial unauthorized history of learning games. So if you're interested at all, you might want to check that out. I did not do a QR code or a link as I should have uh, from the last presentation, but um, didn't do that. I got too caught up in the presentation. Uh, creating it, but we also discovered the connection between games and learning. And so um, we see that there's definite connection, but not just learning. We've seen the connection of, to behaviors and attitudes and outcomes. So lots of good stuff we've seen and heard about games in this presentation. And I do believe now that I have some time for questions. Yes, thank you so much. And we do have questions. And I also just really quickly Googled your YouTube channel. So there is the link in the chat. Everybody oh, can subscribe to that. Thanks. So here is a good question. We'll start with kind of the hardest one first, I think. So games can teach, train, and educate. In your opinion, what's the difference between those three types of games? Are these the matter of cognitive, psychomotor, and effective domains of learning, respectively? So um, I'm not sure I 100%. So, so ask me what's the difference between teaching, educating, and training? And training. So uh, to me, training is much more hands-on. Education is much more abstract. And then uh, teaching is the process of conveying the knowledge or information to the person. So a game can convey knowledge to someone as they play the game. And, and what I want 
uh, everybody to realize is when you create a game, you're not creating the teaching, you're creating the environment in which the teaching can occur. So you don't know what the people are going to do with that game. You don't know that you're actually going to teach them something. You're, you're, you're designing it so that you're hoping to teach them something, but um, you're not actually teaching and you're setting up the environment for that to happen, ideally. Um, educating somebody is giving them broad general knowledge. Like I need to know about the concept of safety in general. And so I understand a, a situational awareness. I might teach through a game, um, being aware of possible dangers, looking for escape routes, all that might be education. And then training might be, okay, if you do see a fire, walk over to the fire extinguisher, pull it from the wall, um, press, aim, squeeze, and sweep, right? You could teach all of that in a game as well. So that's kind of how I look at those three um, different elements. People may see them a little bit differently, but that's kind of my take. <laughs> and I'll say it's my take at the moment. Catch me tomorrow and I may have a different take, but um, that's really kind of what I think those, how those three things work. That's the beauty of always learning. Sometimes definitions change. That's true. And speaking of definitions, we do have a question. What's the difference between a game and a simulation? Yes. So um, technically, a simulation is a realistic depiction of an actual event. So we simulate the weather. We simulate market movement. We simulate a lot of items. So, so there's some people that have very realistic simulations so they can predict whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow. That's a simulation. Uh, a game is an abstract experience with elements added to measure performance. So points, a win state, a lose state, timing, those kind of things. Now, often simulation and games are conflated together. And in fact, some of the research uh, by a woman named Tracy Sitzman, who did a meta-analysis of games and simulations, said, hey, basically, they're both kind of the same, so we're going to put them together. But what happens is a simulation from a learning perspective, sometimes we'll add points to the simulation, right? Sometimes we'll add timing to the simulation. Sometimes we'll make it a little bit more abstract because we don't have time for the 100% fidelity, or we want to speed up time, or we want to... So oftentimes simulation gets game elements added to them. A good game always has a simulation model underneath, like this is what leadership should look like, or this is what good sales should look like. So um, those are kind of the difference. A simulation is, is um, if, if you're on one end of the scale, as pure and as realistic as possible, uh, games are typically abstract with elements to tell you if you've been successful at the game or not. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. Do you have any specific types of games you recommend for asynchronous training? Do you think there needs to be a difference between asynchronous and synchronous? So, um, hmm. well, so you can, <laughs> you can always play games uh, against the computer um, as an asynchronous game. Um, so I think that's important. I think I, th I think not so much synchronous or asynchronous. I think you need to look at the content. So are you teaching declarative knowledge? Certain kind of games, matching games, work well for declarative knowledge. Are you teaching conceptual knowledge? Games where you have to discriminate or put things in one category or another. That's a good for a, a conceptual knowledge. Are you teaching procedural knowledge? Games where you've got to perform certain amount of steps. Those are good for procedural problem solving knowledge, board games, uh, some card games, those kind of things. So it, I, I think it's not, not synchronous or asynchronous, but what's the type of content that you're trying to teach? So for example, I always say, look, look, at, look at a Jeopardy game, right? Great for declarative knowledge, not so much for problem solving, right? So you have to apply the right game to the right situation. Absolutely. And I know that Stephen Bear from the Game Agency has done a presentation on aligning games with training objectives. I'll try to find a link for that and post it in the chat for everybody. Yeah, great, great. We do have, all right, we've got lots more questions for you, Carl. So, yeah, I see one here. Um, somebody asked about um, most effective means to simulate intrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation is internal. So that is typically triggered by curiosity. So the use of mystery, 
uncertainty, um, various outcomes, different ways to get to the ending. All of those are good ways to drive intrinsic motivation. Um, we're intrinsically motivated when we want to find answers, when we don't know where things are headed, when we have a sense of mystery. I think one of the things in a lot of um, elements that we're missing is um, the sense of mystery or the sense of unknown. Um, when we tell people things, they're like, yeah, I already know that. So what? Um, but if you ask them questions. So I always say this, learning objective. I'm going to teach you four ways to close a sale. A good salesperson says, I know five ways you're wasting my time. But what if you turn it into a question and said, do you know the number one way sales are closed in our organization? Stay tuned and we'll tell you. Now you've got my attention. Maybe I already know, but I want to know if I do the number one. So now I'm engaged. So just by turning objectives into questions, we can drive intrinsic motivation. So sorry, I, I kind of hijacked that question, but I saw it in the chat. <laughs> no, it's great. You're answering the questions. That's what we want. Do you think that gamification has a negative connotation for some people derived from individuals who use it to describe taking game elements and adding extrinsic motivations such as badge systems or points to content. Yeah, it definitely, I mean, there's, a, there's an essay floating around that says, you know, gamification is BS. There's, uh, when gamification first came out, a lot of serious game designers were offended that non-game people would use game elements. And like good instructional designers have been doing that for years. Um, does game can gamification be used improperly? Absolutely, it can be. Points badges and lead, leaderboards are are very much used inappropriately, um, but lectures are used inappropriately. Discussions are used inappropriately. Um, pre and post readings are used inappropriately. Videos are used inappropriately. So we don't say, oh, never use video because I saw a really bad, boring video. And so video is horrible. No, no, no. We say, look, here's the right way to create a video to encourage learning. Well, here's the right way to do gamification to encourage learning. And there's been a growing amount of research on the right way to do it. So does it have a bad rap? Yes. In some companies, I can't even say the word gamification. Um, I was doing some consulting in Mexico, actually. And uh, for this, the, the second largest conglomerate in Mexico, walked into the uh, called Grupo Selenes. I walked into the chairman's office. He had just arrived in a helicopter, beautiful mahogany desk, uh, portraits of him everywhere. Like the chairs cost more than my house. And uh, the very first thing he said to me in perfect English, because I can't speak another language because I'm American, in perfect English, he says, I hate the word gamification. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, this is going to be fun. I'm like, why did you even bring me here? But he loved the concept and idea of it. So there's definitely a negative connotation. Um, and definitely it's some of uh, the people that have implemented it incorrectly, it's, it's their fault. And also, you know, uh, when any new technology or concept comes out, it's the, it's the quote unquote answer to everything. Right. So, uh, it's not the answer to everything. So nothing is the answer to everything. Um, so that's why it's gotten a bad rap. But yeah, yeah, it has to be used carefully and effectively just like any other concept or idea or technology. We are, we have a couple questions about kind of what you just touched on. Is there data on gamification being impactful in adult learning? Is there data on whether collaborative or individual games are more effective? And I know we probably don't have time to answer those, but I will say that Carl has written several books on gamification, and I see that Jen posted in the chat a link to his website. There are probably answers in those books to some of these questions that we're being asked right now. There are, and some of the, the um, links here are, um, are linked to peer-reviewed, excuse me, peer-reviewed articles. So, um, this is one on, you know, changing attitudes. It's a review on the effectiveness of educational games. Um, another one is, is another review. So there is, there is actually research on collaborative games are better than individual games for learning. So there's some research on that. There's some research on 
uh, when gamification is effective, um, how gamification motivates. Um, so yeah, there there definitely is there's definitely is information about that. All and right. you can check out my books. I've got information there as well. And my LinkedIn learning courses. I do cite some research in those courses as well. <clears throat> Good thing we're done. I'm running out of voice. I know. Yes. So we are going to wrap up this right now so that we can give people a few minutes to refresh their water or go to the bathroom before their next session. But thank you so much, Carl. This was really informative. We're getting great feedback in the chat. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care, everyone.